About um, <clears throat> six months ago, uh, we began in Priya a study on, uh, in partnership with Intrac, a uh, study on what's happening to civil society in India with a particular lens on uh, economic growth and its implications. <clears throat> so what I would do, I mean, the study is still going on. We have done about 50-odd interviews and looked at some of the secondary literature. So my presentation is not structured nicely around the study findings, but more around issues that are emerging from, uh, <clears throat> from that. So we are looking at civil society at crossroads in India and the Im implications of the economic growth of past decade or 12, 13 years. So what, what are some of the implications of rapid economic growth in India over the last 10, 12 years? <clears throat> Huge domestic market, bigger middle class, greater disposable income. One sec. Rapid urbanization and migration from rural areas to towns. Just to give you a statistic, 57% of our GDP is now service sector and agriculture accounts for less than 18% though officially roughly two-thirds of our population resides in rural areas. So we recently had a census uh, about uh, urbanization, 2011. Uh, Ten years ago we had about 4,000 plus urban habitations, now we have 7,000. And officially the population has become nearly 30 percent, though uh, out of 377 million people living in urban areas, you can add another 100 million who uh, sort of have breakfast, lunch, and dinner in urban areas and sleep in some village. That's all. So, huge migration. Uh, as uh, <clears throat> Amula was saying, increased inequalities and conflict over natural resources in what we are calling socio geographies. These are geographically located conflicts with social groups like indigenous people. Uh, and, and so the, the growth has taken place in south and west, and the conflict over natural resources is in east. Open and competitive media, widespread mobile connectivity, nearly 500 pe million people are connected on mobile, though internet penetration is very poor. And one of the other implications of rapid economic growth is global power mindsets. And not just in the government or politicians, not just in the big multinational Indian corporates, but generally everybody says, oh, we are a global power. Increased remittances and both FDI as well as India as a destination of FDI as well as a source. In both 2009 and 2010 fiscal year, more money was invested outside India than was invested in India. We have heard about uh, Aid India Agency, as has been referred to in Brian's. Kostam and I met our foreign secretary a week ago, and he said, what agency? Um, <clears throat> and of course, we are G20, so we are BRICS, we are IPSA. Uh, we are supposed to hold the BRICS meeting next April. Um, so global power mindsets. Uh, newspapers and stories are full of how important we are in the global arena. Okay. New realities in civil society, point number two. As a consequence of the uh, implications of economic growth, what has happened? Number one, most importantly, Brian mentioned, Others said, disappearance of ODA and flexible funding from international NGOs. All of you have closed shops in India, or if not, you're likely to do it in the next 12 months. Government of India now offers huge funding to NGOs, but it comes in the form of tenders and contracts, 
and you have to compete with price water out coopers and their ilk so service delivery contracts from governments in tenders competing with international consultants so all of us now have uh, updated cvs in our files we can send and uh, i will be collecting a few more from some of you <laughs> because we have discovered these international consultants actually don't have staff they just have cvs <laughs> we were fools uh for profit sector for profit private sector has made inroads in social sectors health education water sanitation housing for the poor etc etc and there is a rise of csr in fact there is a new bill for co corporate company affairs uh, bill for which is likely to government is saying mandate 2% of your profit to csr compulsorily i'm not sure it's damn good and lastly there are spontaneous citizen movements some of you may have heard about anti corruption movement going on this year and it is picking up more heat hopefully next monday onwards anna azare will sit again and so will many others um uh, but this is not just the only movement there are lots of such movements they're spontaneous they're sporadic they're short term they're coming from the young people some from middle class some from poor and basically they focused on resisting a development model which disturbs them dislocates them or harasses them or which they demand accountability the most important ones in my view have been the ones where bomb blasts take place regularly in india and every time there's a bomb blast all our senior politicians and intelligence chiefs and all proclaim that we will fix it and we have another bomb blast so now whenever there is a bomb blast there is a protest by citizens not against the bombers but against our security heads which is a good thing because bombers can be anybody so what are the challenges at crossroads in civil society for indian civil society uh as mike said i am amazed uh, he lifted some of my points um <clears throat> civil society space is both shrinking and opening and there is a great visibility in the last 6 months indian media has used civil society phrase almost more regularly than god almighty so allah and ram and jesus are remembered less frequently than civil society is but visibility is both positive and hostile so how media does you know some days they stand you up on the pedestal next they pull the pedestal down so first day they said oh your civil society is so important second day they said oh by the way what were you doing 10 years ago and 10 years ago you were in the indian police service or you were digging somebody else's grave or whatever the second uh, phenomena that is emerging is that you know we had a period of political emergence in india between 1970 5 and 77 and that period where our constitution was suspended and uh, is actually a, a disjuncture in the democratic tradition of post independent india but is also a place in history where new forms of voluntary associations and development organizations and civil society groups began to emerge post 1978 79 many of them were activists during the pre um, uh, emergency period so these are the folks like me who are sort of in their now early 60s you guessed my age right and um, what is happening to them around the country many of the people we interviewed they're basically saying well, our time is now over you know kind of what i am calling here generational stagnation of post emergency leadership a red card my god lost my yellow huh? <laughs> lost the yellow i thought i'll first get the yellow <laughs> i'm so sorry when the mula got the yellow card i was hoping a ah, green green ah <laughs> oh the red <laughs> this group of people are now 
facing a generational stagnation, basically post-emergency leadership. They are more or less given up that they can't transform their organizations or their work. A whole bunch of new people, young people are coming into development and civil society and all that, some for limited transitory purpose. Those days of, you know, we have come to dedicate our life to this work are over. I was interviewing a new person for Priya and I was telling her that, look, you know, we don't, we are not looking for short term people. She said, no, I'm very clear. I want to make a commitment for long. I said, how long? One year, sir. <laughs> I, I just, you know, had to drink some water. I said, my God, that's pretty long, eh? <laughs> but the young people, unfortunately, <clears throat> or fortunately, as you may see it, there's a, a historical approach. Oh, somebody did it before. So there's a, you know, you're starting from saying the train moves today. So this must be the first platform, that kind of thing. There is a greater pressure, therefore, to look for resources from within society. A point that uh, my friend and mentor, Alan Fowler, has been making for more than a decade. But there are demands for rootedness in that and tangibility. Tangibility meaning Local resources are still coming for something very tangible. You want to say, oh, I want to do governance reform, forget it. You want to feed the hungry? Of course. Blankets, food, schools, healthcare, vaccines, you know, that kind of tangibility. So resources locally, whether it's individuals who give foundations, private uh, companies, CSRs or whatever, but resources for social mobilization, point that was being made by earlier speakers, and resources for accountability of governance are lagging behind. Considering particularly, because now both the government and the private sector are into social development in a big way. You know, our GDP has grown 10 times in the last decade, but annual growth rate of 9% of economy, but on human development index, we haven't even moved 1%. So that's the contradiction. There are, there's a growth area for social enterprise, microfinance, and a whole bunch of, you know, sort of combining social and economic benefits kind of model. So market links projects are coming up, but the challenge is to maintain critical autonomy of your work and not become sort of, you know, money lenders or, um, you know, uh, service providers of poor quality at cheap rate because higher quality may require more payments. And the last point that I want to make is that bulk of the Indian civil society, indigenous as it is, is yet to sort of reflect on what are its new obligations or, or roles or, you know, in respect of this global arrival of India. Because most of the time, India being so large and problematic, you know, we get hassled and busy with our local activity only. We rarely think about what is our solidarity gesture for those who are occupying whatever is left? Why don't we help them to occupy more since we are 1.2 billion? So this Indian national boundary limited focus, how to open that up at the same time as the governments and the private sector are now on the global arena as a big player. So that's a big, big question that how to develop partnerships uh, for the sort of global solidarity in the region, particularly in Asia first and then beyond. So those are some of the points. Thank you very much.